Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers for $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. How are we all doing tonight on this Monday Night Live? Uh, this won't be as rowdy as last week's call-in show about forward-facing sonar. My God, that was like calling Cowboys fans and Redskins fans to chat about their team. Uh, I love all the passion, though, on, of, on either side of the argument. We're not doing a call-in show tonight, but next week we're going to be live from Jake's Bait and Tackle with Doc, who is a legendary smallmouth river fisherman. He agreed to do a call-in show in person. I am trying to get better software because if I have a, a remote guest, they can't actually answer. They can't send you the question, talk to you, and you hear them back because of what I have. But if you're in studio, you can. So next week, that's what we're going to do. But without further ado, I do have someone that we've been chomping at the victory to get back on a live stream. Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Guide Services, the man, the myth, the legend. He is finally back with us. How are you doing tonight, sir? Dude, I am fantastic. The intro is top notch getting the wife involved, uh, send it to the moon. Hilarious. Yeah. That was her first tournament that she fished and she actually won the damn thing with a kid. Yeah. I watched it, dude. That's, uh, that's pretty exciting, but that was, that gave me a, that gave me a good, uh, that gave me a good laugh. How are you, my friend? I'm doing pretty good. And that's something I don't, did your wife ever go fishing with you or is that not her thing at all? Not really her thing. Tournaments, definitely not. Um, she's not a super fan of, hey, let's go 65, 68 miles an hour. That's not really her jam. Um, she's more of the cruise speed. Um, but also, I tell her, like, hey, come fishing. It's really not that hard. And she throws a guy tech for about 10 minutes and says she doesn't get a bite and it sucks and moves on. So she's more of the sunbathing, uh, sunbathing type. That's more for you, though. For sure. Um, so for me. What have you been up to recently? I mean, the last time I think we talked was poof, like just as the summer kind of got going and we went through everything there. What's been happening in your world? Yeah. Um, guiding was crazy, man. This this year, I mean, we've, we've talked about this on every podcast I've done with you, man. There's there's not a lot of bass guides down here and this lake's getting more popular by the month. And um, for me specifically, I'm super blessed and, and the way that the business kind of fell and, and took off. I'm doing a crazy amount of guide trips, which it's been awesome to see the variety of people coming down to the lake and the scope of, of new fishermen and older fishermen and tournament guides and dudes that struggle in the summer and all that sort of stuff. But, um, normally in my life, the last couple of years, I get August off just because we don't really have a ton of weddings to do and, um, get to go fun fish. But I was pretty much on the water almost every day from, from late June through um, through the end of August, so starting to slow down a little bit, which is uh, which is definitely needed, um, just to kind of recalibrate and, and balance life out a little bit. I feel like I definitely gained maybe some like guide fishing weight because um, I wasn't able to hit the the gym or the peloton at all, and you're getting home late and leaving early. But lots of guiding, a um, little bit of. Um, you know, life stuff happened. So we're pregnant. I don't think we were having nope. that discussion on the last time. So we are well on our way to having a baby girl, which is super awesome and crazy exciting. And then on top of that, we are psycho and we bought another puppy. So now we have three dogs. So we have a puppy, a baby on the way, tons of guiding, weddings, a few other businesses. And like you kind of said before, dude, just burning burning it on both ends. So you're a masochist. <laughs> yep. I believe in massive chaos and uh, I don't know, dude, I've always been the, uh, I've unfortunately just, I don't know if that's from my upbringing or whatever. We can have a therapy session after this offline, but um, just always have a hard time of sitting for more than a couple of days at a time, not doing much and feeling like just the world's passing you by at a million miles an hour. So kind of always feel like I got to be doing something that's pushing me forward, whether that's fitness or, food or fishing or faith or dogs, whatever, whatever I kind of need to do. So I got my little vices here and there to, to get me through stuff, but I'm usually just running probably like 120 miles an hour. It's going to stop at some point because my body's going to give out, but, um, just been rocking and rolling, man. 
that's usually how I go about it. My barometer is like, if I get sent to the hospital or I just pass out, that's when I dial back. I mean, I know, and you guys know that have been following the show that I've gone back from three to four episodes. We're dialing it down a little bit. Cause I was close to like a hundred hours a week with that and a real job and all that other stuff. And yep. yeah, you just push, but ADHD is a superpower too. So <laughs> it allows you to do some things. Yeah. It's just, because who needs sleep, dude? Who cares? You'll sleep when you're dead. That's yeah. my motto. Yeah, 100%. That's the truth. On the fishing side of things, we mentioned something with, you know, huge shout out to Derek, uh, who just won a, his BFL. Yep, congrats. Her. Why is it that her always gets the super tournaments when I, I, I tried to look back through BFL stuff before we got started here? Smith has never held a super tournament, right? Or it's, it's very rare. It's mm-hmm. her. I don't know that off the top of my head, but yeah, not that. Not that anyone's told me or anyone's ever mentioned in the past of like, oh, this super tournament was a banger at Smith or anything like that. Um, you know how I feel about bugs. So I, as a transplant here, I feel like everyone is stuck in nostalgia with the place of what it was, sounds like maybe 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely, it's changed a lot in the four years I've been there. I mean, the um, the river grass or whatever that like, very stocky asparagus looking grass is everywhere, bro. It's everywhere down there now. Um, And I know bugs did start F ones, correct? Yes, they did uh, with a partnership with North Carolina and Virginia. So, I mean, we're talking four or five years from now, it's probably going to be completely different too, but that place has my number dude. The last four, like three or four ABAs that I've gone to, I've dropped big ones right next to the boat. They eat crankbait so weird there. It makes me scratch my head every time. Like it's so vast yet so small when you find them as far as kind of the area goes. So for me, congrats to Derek. I mean, it sounds like kind of God intervened and show him kind of showed him where to go and where to catch them, um, which is awesome. And that dude definitely um, knows how to fish and knows how to find them um that's clear with what he did in the toyotas and everything else so congrats to him but it did look like it was a pretty big struggle bus for for most of the field and this is a good segue because we're talking about transitioning and fall transitioning is it the same on every lake because everyone in my comment section and all all online was talking about you know the september transition on kerr is it kind of comparable to to kerr to smith or is it just every lake is different and how it goes through that that turnover I feel like every lake's different, specifically this year. I mean, I've got, so Smith Mountain, we'll, we'll talk about obviously and where it's at. And it's definitely not in a normal September like mode, in my opinion. We had a really weird summer and September's queuing up to be very short as far as the transition goes. But I've got friends that are on Lake Anna that have been crushing Anna for 20 days in the back of pockets, like October time frame stuff in 80 plus degree water. Um, and I went to bugs a few weeks ago, um, and kind of the same thing. I mean, the spots are on the lower end and setting up like they normally would. And then most of the deep stuff that I looked at, there just wasn't even many bass around it. They were all already transitioning halfway back in po- halfway back in pockets and kind of already on the way, um, with 80, I mean, I saw 87 on my Garmin at bugs which garmin runs cold that's like 88 89 degree water and those fish were in four feet of water Hmm. Um, so sorry about the footsteps the old puppy's just gonna run around like a crazy person you're fine gotta wear them out what did you get another border collie because they're the best why (laughs) dude they're too they're so smart that it's like training is like he came fully crate trained which was phenomenal like if for anybody that's interested in getting a puppy or only has one dog and gets two or whatever, it's like this bewitching hour at dusk, which they're probably going to do while we're doing this is like that hour before dark, they're just going to zoom around and wear him out like crazy. Um, but what we've been having to do is in the morning, he wants to wake up at five in the morning when I wake up to go to the lake. So Taylor started putting him in his crate right away. No crate training needed. Just was chill about it. Cool about mm. it. Learn sit and lay down in like a day, um, knows his name. Like they're just so smart that it's hard for me not to go with this breed now because I just don't have to do that much work to, to train them. So it's just the energy level is insane, but sorry about that guys. Just, uh, back on track with the puppy talk there. He is cute as hell. My friend, he is awesome. Okay. 
we got to show it off to the camera then. You can't hype that up. There he goes. Come here, buddy. And while we're doing this, it's a good time. Guys, let me know in the comment section how the audio is. Do I have to adjust anything on my end? Just give me a thumbs up, thumbs down in the audio section. <sighs> oh, my gosh. He is adorable. How old now? How what? How old? 21 weeks, maybe. I mean, he looks crazy white right now with the, the hotness of the of the mic or whatever, but he's so adorable. Yep. He's, uh, and he's going to be pretty big too, dude. His arms are crazy long. All right, go. All right. Everybody up. Everybody up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go. You guys have a dog? Yes, we have a, we, we have a border collie golden retriever mix. Done dude. America. All right. They won't interrupt. Oh, no. They're just basically family. Yeah. yeah, it's just so interesting to me, like the the cur dilemma here, because I was actually I'm on a I'm on a thread with a couple of friends, SB fishing, and we talk about literally if you live in this area, you have to conquer cur to move on in anything, and it's yeah. so weird yeah. because if you rank every lake, which one's better? Cur's at the bottom. Like, what are you gonna pick, cur or Smith? Smith, Lake Anna or cur? Lake Anna, it, but it's just, it's so weird. That one gets all the praise every, every year. It always gets the top billing. Yeah. I mean, logistically, I understand like it's massive. So everyone's not going to be fishing, fishing on top of each other. It's got crazy ramps at all different locations for people to, to kind of boat in from everything. Um, there is a lot of bass in there. It's just for me, I've never been able to crack the 16 to 19 pound bag. I've cracked 12s and 14s every once in a while, but it's like, it's like a nine pound factory for me mm -hmm. um, or coming down to like that one bite. And then again, it's just got my number dude. I've thrown the last three big ones off on a crankbait right next to the boat. And it's just like, it just makes you want to just run into the bank. Um, so I think it's probably a logistics thing. It's close to North Carolina. It's close to it's close to Virginia. People can hit 95 and shoot it straight down. It's it's probably got to do with that. But again, going back to my first point, I'm sure there's tournament directors that fished it 15 years ago when it was cracking off and it was awesome and bass was all about it. And um, that probably just draws that probably just draws people there. Yeah, sadly, I think that's what it is because you can't tell me like, why Kirk gets top building over Smith for like, I don't know, a bass open maybe. Like, oh, come on, really? Like, yeah. and, and that because, and guys, with this podcast, you know, it's not just about the turns, it's really about highlighting the waterways. And I would like them to show off a Smith or something like that because it it can go off. I thought the BFL, that, I, I think it was the April BFL that narrows it down that you were in. Yeah. Hit, that thing hit at the right time. That, that, yeah. the weights were awesome. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's yeah. It'd be, it'd be nice to see a tournament here too. That's not March, April. I'd love to see, I'd love to see dudes try to crack a September, September deal here. And well, I say that now as we're about to talk about September, not being like September and the fishing is actually really good, but um, you know, that's the whole dilemma with tournament bass fishing too, is those guys want to deer hunt. So they don't, don't fish in September, October when it's pretty tough in the South, they're all deer hunting and Turkey hunting and doing all that um and all that jazz but yeah bugs bugs is bugs man and um hopefully they catch on and, and fish some others like we talked about gaston's firing off anna's firing off pretty good sounds like the potomac's getting better mm -hmm. um and the potomac gets a decent amount of tournaments but but smith kind of gets left in the dust after may my friend and that is such a shame and, and i would like to as we talk about the transition here what would you consider the hardest month for smith then Normally it's September. Is it September? Okay. Yeah. yeah. For the four, for the three seasons that I have had here, September has been pretty tough. Um, most of those months, but this, this year, and I've talked to a few other guys about it also, they never went really deep. I mean, I, I never had to fish deeper than 15 feet with guide clients to catch good numbers and decent size ones and throw in a big one every once in a while. Um, I never got on a crazy good deep brush pile worm bite, um, throwing a big spoon, never really got on much deep cranking. Never really, I never really had to throw anything that dove deeper than 15 feet. And, um, I think a lot of that was, if we look back, hell, even go to our podcast back in, in the spring is we had a super delayed spring. The bluegills didn't spawn till late July. Um, and they were, the bluegills were on the way out come probably two and a half, three weeks ago, but I had a guide trip 
let's say three weeks ago, I'm not hundred percent sure where it was fifties in the morning in August for two wow. days. Um, where I was wearing like a rain suit and a sweatshirt in August till 10 o'clock in the morning. And we smoked them for those two days because the bluegills had just kind of started transitioning off of their beds and into the riprap stuff. And it's like two weeks later, they're on the main lake points. And now we're already having, you're looking at the graph on the app and the, it's a downward trajectory of all the water temperatures on the whole lake. Hmm. Uh, so I just don't think they're going to go. I don't think they're going to go out anymore. I think they're put, putting paws on the points and they'll be back in the backs of the pockets here in the next two to three weeks. We have to talk about turnover a little bit on this just to make sure that everyone's prepared for that. Um, but if it's not this type of September where we're having fifties and then high nineties for four days and then back and forth, if it stays cool where it's going to drop that water and it's going to turn over and then stay that low, then I think we're going to have a really short fall transition. And I also want to mention or, or ask you too, how, cause we are in hurricane season, how hurricanes do affect it. Does that speed up the transition with that big dumping of cold water into yes. it or, or how does that play into it? Uh, as much as I hate hurricanes for the people that are in hurricane areas, hurricanes are amazing and I love them for Smith mountain and for fishing. If we get, I, I mean, when do we have uh, a hurricane already? Uh, two weeks ago, like an mm -hmm. August hurricane that hit hit the U.S. Um, if we get a hurricane in the next two months, that's left out like a leftover residue hurricane on Smith with where the fish are, it's going to be lights out. Um, if we get some of the clear water stained up and they bring the water level up, um, or it brings the water level up, or up in the rivers, if we get some really good color coming down, the fish are already staged to where they should be that it could be it could be a really fun fall with shallow water fishing that's freaking awesome so guys yeah. let me because just for topic's sake i'll bang out these questions now that aren't about just necessarily just smith what we talked about then we can segue into it here we Great. got we got fishing coach that said they held a super about three to four years ago at smith my first tournament yeah that's my point it's been a very long time since they've done that um let's see uh there is enough there is not enough places to stay for big tournaments yeah. here I, but yeah, I mean, over there. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at, I mean, we run an Airbnb in our basement. I do, I get tournament guys here all the time and they're repeat, they're repeat guys now, like well above, as soon as the BFL schedule is going to drop, I'm going to get calls from guys saying they want the Airbnb. Um, because it is, we have one motel and, the uh, Harbor Inn, I think maybe has 25 rooms. So yeah, you're talking, most of the dudes are having to stay in Rocky Mountain, 30 minute drive is a lake plus Lynchburg's 45 minutes. Um, I mean, yeah, he's probably right. If we're talking a super tournament, that's got 200 guys. There's just, you're, you're talking Airbnb. How many people though actually do a hotel versus an Airbnb? Because it seems like more and more, even when I went to High Rock to hang out with friends, you get an Airbnb, you can it's all stay there. Yeah, it's safer on your boat than parking in a hotel. Like, I don't know. Like, I just wonder sure. if that argument's going to go away after some time. Because, yeah, I don't know. I think the Airbnb thing is, is smarter. Yeah, agree. I mean, there's plenty of houses on Smith Mountain that are waterfront, dock, have a private ramp literally at their house like that you could squat up with eight guys yes. um, and and get it close to probably what a shady motel would cost you um so yeah I, I don't know if that's necessarily the deal parking's a little bit iffy too with the ramps i mean parkway's a one of the bigger ramps but 200 guys getting in there that's super tight um so could could be a little bit to it, but I think people would make it work to try to come to do a turn a super here. So and then we got Brandon here. Where would you want the BFLs to go? Mm. So if you're asking me, the Shenandoah division is the Shenandoah division. They shouldn't be on Kerr that you go to Lake Anna. Period. Like that's stupid that you have to go to Kerr if you're in the Shenandoah division. And you guys are gonna say it's too small. I fished a BFL on Indian Lake in Ohio. That's a goddamn pond with 200 boats. Shut up. You're spoiled. You're fine. We can do like Anna, like this whole idea. It's, it's, it's too small. You know, other places in the country, they still have BFLs and it's tight as shit. Just yeah. be better fish. Good. I don't know. <laughs> Lighter line. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just such a weird thing when you have these people like it's too small. It's like, okay, so you live on like you fall or someplace like that. Not every place has that. Look at those poor Ohio boys. Like yeah. it's insane. 
sure. Yeah. yeah, we could all be fishing the Ohio River. Oh God. I had a guy on about this was off topic, but he's an up upstate PA and he had to fish a three rivers event. And he said he caught his kicker and it was 14 inches and he was sweating bullets to get it in the boat. And it's like, that is so depressing. How the hell are you a bass fisherman up there? If that is if what you have to deal with. Uh, Brew tank. Thank you. This is a great segue question right here. Uh, going to be at Smith mountain, Smith mountain all next week. Never fished a deep lake, only fish tidal Potomac. Tell me what to do, Billy. Thank you. That is a great segue. Brew, we're gonna we're gonna start uh, start talking about transition, then, my friend. And um, Thomas and I are gonna pull up a map for everybody too, so we can do some kind of map analysis on this one, just to to show you guys. So every podcast I bring it up, rule of three, brother. It's the best way to break down fishing, best way to break down lakes, best way to break down where they're at, water, all that sort of stuff is. Fall transition, in my opinion, the three things you're paying attention to is daylight hours, light, um, daylight hours, your low temperatures at night, and speed. So a lot of people think that the fall transition is going to take two months. Okay, it's this big slowdown, leaves are going to change, we're all looking at nature, all that sort of stuff. Fishing is completely different, in my opinion, with that. The bait fish already know going into August that they're getting less daylight um, per day. It's just nature. It's how it works. Daylight savings time is made up. Um, they just run on daylight. So the bait is already going to start transitioning from super deep long points, channel swings, all of that super deep summer suspended goofy stuff. And they're going to push to the bank on those steeper walls and on those steeper drops. But if you get a stretch in September that's a little bit unique for Virginia, for example, what we're going to go to through in like the next like five or six days, I think today it was supposed to be in the 80s, but from the next like eight days, I can see we have lows in the high 50s to 60s. That's going to drop the water temperature every morning um, by maybe a half degree. And then it's going to get dark. I mean, it's 630 and I'm looking out the window. It's almost it's going to be sunset in 25, 30 minutes. Mm. So that is the first transition that you want to look for and really think about how those fish and bait fish are going to move. Second thing that I talked about is those lows. So take a look at your weather app. What you don't want to see in September as far as when fishing is going to get tough again is if we get five days of cooling temperatures and five days of blazing hot. Those five days of blazing hot are just going to pump the brakes super hard on bait fish, crawdads, bluegills, bass. Everybody's just going to pump the brakes. And what we're going to run into is the water isn't going to be stratified anymore with turnover. So I'll talk about that in a split second. My last one is speed. This is the time of year when you need to mess with changing your weights on your Texas rig, your shaky head. Um, how fast are you reeling in a crankbait? How fast is your gear ratio on your reels for a chatterbait or a trap? How fast are you working your top water? How slow? They get really finicky this time of year with it moving the same speed as what the forage is moving. Um, and so you have to play with that every day to figure out what, what they're wanting that specific day. You can go back to basics pretty heavy in September. If it's a cloudy day in September and it's cool, they're probably going to chew top water most of the day in September if you're around the bait. Um, if it's a bright, sunny post front day, you're probably going to end up dragging something just as a general start. You can throw top water still, but it might be a situation that you need to speed it up so they don't get a look at it at all. Um, or it really needs to match the size of, of what bait fish they're chasing around. So the sunnier days post front in September are tougher. Um, but speed is something that's always on my mind, um, when it comes to guiding out here and when the tournament stuff starts rolling in here is, is probably one of the top three things that's on my mind. One other thing I I'd like to add too is everyone that reads the Bass Masters or most publications out there, they always talk about like the winter drawdown. Um, and cause that's, what's basically because the media source for fishing is basically Tennessee, Alabama. And that's what they do. Does, is Smith subject to that as well? Smith Mountain Lake? Not nearly as fluctuating as the as the tva stuff so for anyone who hasn't been to this lake before we're in a chain of lakes that runs from the roanoke river up in the mountains all the way down to the ocean 
So Bugs Island is essentially the same water that's in Smith Mountain. Smith Mountain dumps into Leesville, turns into a river, goes into Bugs, turns into Gaston, down to the Roanoke Rapid, out to the ocean. We are the first lake in the chain. We're on a hydroelectric uh, dam that can actually pump water up and let water go down to generate electricity. And so the agreement with AEP is that this lake should only be fluctuating four feet um, from full pond, which the only time I have ever seen it swing more than two feet is major flood events like a hurricane um, or a crazy spring rain. So in most cases, what I'm, I, I don't pay attention a ton on to what the water level looks like. Um, it's more of going to be in like that one to two foot max draw, uh, drawdown. And in most cases, they're not doing it quickly. Um, we've had two weird drawdowns in the last three weeks though, where it's definitely like, okay, somebody like flushed the toilet too many times. Um, and it's dropped like almost two feet in like 24 hours. Um, but they start pumping it back probably two days, two days later. So we have a gradual decline, um, of a water drop. And with the way that this lake sets up, there's enough, there's enough riprap that's got depth on it that you're still going to have plenty of stuff to fish, even if the lake was down three feet. Um, it's not going to be a ton, but you're still going to have, you're still going to have some that will be able to do it. So it's not, it's not a TVA drawdown type of deal for anybody that's interested. There's an app called SML plus. Let me see if it's the right one. Hold on. Um, yeah. SML plus the icons like a sun with two green mountains and a half circle of a lake, but awesome little app. It's got water temperature gauges all over the lake that they just put in last year, which is clutch. And then it's got, um, it's got just an overall lake water level and it tells you hourly what's, what is the drop rate? Um, which is, which is a good way to, good way to kind of keep an eye on that. So that's really interesting guys. And Hey, now everyone knows, um, did you want to control the map or did you want me to, uh, either way works. I think you already have it up in the queue. Let's see if Billy boy knows how to use this. If not, hopefully he knows how to use a computer. He knows how to use a Garmin. All right, hold on. And then while he's doing that, guys, I will answer some of your questions. Um, I, okay. This is, I, I love your name here. I'm string chill, Phil pot. Uh, I'm string chill. What about Phil pot? Because it turns on in September through November. I have no idea about that. That is very interesting. Phil pot. I know has a big problem with Alabama bass though. Um, SML's little brother. Or call it SML's little brother. I like Phil Pot, dude. I smashed some walleyes in there in a practice for an ABA last year. It was awesome on a jerk bait. How big is Phil Pot? Tiny. Yeah. You could you could draft it in two two full days if you really put your head down and grind it out some oh, 14 man. hour days. I feel like you could you could graph a decent amount of it. Big drop offs. Um yeah, big drop offs, but it's a cool, it's a cool little lake. It's got some it's got some pretty good bass in it. They had a pretty good college tournament there years ago. All right, all right, guys, I'll add that to the list. We'll, we'll, we'll do a deep dive about that eventually, too, since that's another lake we can add. Um, I think, oh, I see it up on the queue, too. You got it? Am I doing it right? Yeah, I see it. Heck yeah. All right. So going in, oh gosh, Navionics, why do you do that? Going into um, just general transition. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where they are on Smith as opposed to just general September because they are ahead. Um, but what we ended up getting at Smith was all of this offshore point stuff that we normally fish into August, July, um, a little bit of September, in my opinion, for me, never really happened. I was never having to fish crazy hard channel swings like this out off the bank this far. I was eventually out in this type of stuff um and kind of these you know a little bit kind of closer banks but with how smith is set up now um and where the bluegill ended up we're already moving back into kind of pocket entrances here 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 and secondaries like this um which like i said september transition time it either can take a long time if we have that ebb and flow of, of water temperature or if we get a consistent 10 days of cooling they're going to pop off and they're going to be super shallow before 
um, before you realize. So hmm. that's a little bit of what's been going on at Smith. But what you guys really want to be paying attention to is tighter contours that are dumping into wider contours. That's going to be that transition time of those fish, the, the bigger population that did go out on these points. Um, running back to where that transition is and the weather's going to dictate if they're going to hit pause on that transition spot or if they're going to keep going back. So I will just find some random spot here. And I will say Navionics is a uh, Garmin product now. I wish I could pull up my Garmin deal on... Uh, is that certain models that let you do that? Or is it just with the app? Just with the app. All right. So let's just use this big, big channel swing. So it's lower end stuff. You guys can see we got the main river channels making this big S curve right here. You got a super, super long secondary here. As you guys can see, this would have been main bait chasing kind of channel swing type of area. And we're looking at an area that's similar to this in September. So you've got bluff wall meeting point right here, we've got a couple docks that are going into this flat pocket here. This transition area is where a lot of the bass made it to and then completely stopped. Bluegills were spawning back in these types of areas right here, transitioning out, stopping in the riprap. We were able to catch them for weeks longer than we should have. Um, and those bluegills are still there. Um, and so what turned out to be our year was really not having to go that far out on these secondaries um, and come back into into pockets. Um, here's another good example of channel swing. Your stopping point is right here. Those fish are already back on this secondary, and I would bet to say they're already back on these two secondaries back here. Potentially in the next week and a half, there could be bait as far back as here. Try to see if I can find another good example. All right, it's a pretty straightforward kind of community-ish type of spot, but same thing, secondary point right here. This is as far as the bass would have made it out for us here in September this year. Now they're already coming in, transitioning back on these tighter contours to where we're getting a wider area here. And again, if we do get those three or you know, three to eight, 10 days of cold, those fish are gonna dip out from here really, really fast this year on Smith and run back onto these flatter secondaries. Um, and what we should be seeing is in, in, in my thought process, I'm not a fortune teller, but looking forward is what is normally like November timeframe, late October, November timeframe of these back pocket kind of ditches and haunts is they're going to be there more to early October, um, just with where I'm seeing bait. So the other parts are too, for example, the guy that's coming next week, I would take a half of a day, my friends, and I would be going and trying to find as much bait as possible. It should be somewhat, um, you should be able to replicate it somewhat frequently this time of year um, with you found bait in eight feet of water, halfway back in a creek arm like this, we'll then start running all of these creek arms halfway back and find where you can find those bait balls and just start running that type of pattern because most of them are gonna be going back. So that's my first question because this came up in a conversation today with some friends that fish the, the, the BFL super tournament occur. How much bait is too much bait? Mm. Is I, that an uh, issue? Yes, hundred percent. Um, and I think that's time on the water. And I think that's kind of the gut feeling that you have from spending that time on the water. I don't like to see top to bottom bait this time of year. It's too much. The bait's such a uniform size that if your bait is not, again, swimming the exact same speed or the right speed for it to get the reaction, it's the wrong color, it's the wrong size. Um, it's hard to get a bite when they're just vacuum cleaning up bait. I like to see isolated bait balls where it almost separates the predatory fish. Um, so let's say you've got a bait ball. I wish I was able to like pull up screen examples, but let's say your live scope set at 80 feet. I want to see four separate bait balls every 25 feet with three bass swimming mm -hmm. underneath them or to the side of them. Those are catchable bass. I don't want to see a hundred feet of bait 
top to bottom, 20 feet deep and six or seven bass underneath them. Those ones, in my opinion, are harder to catch um, than those isolated kind of bait balls. Think about it like, like if it's isolated structure, it's easier for them to pick, say, uh, like, for example, here, I got a little like pulse, pulse head with a, with a fluke on it. It's easier for them to pick this out if there's 50 minnows and yours flies out of the side of the school, as opposed to 500. Mm. Um, and it's just not as unique looking in my opinion. And guys, with that said, uh, boom, I just put the number in chat. So two, four, zero. 542-9877 the ADHD kicked in this is what we're going to do leave a voicemail on our hotline and then if the voicemail is good we'll play it on the show for Billy to at, to answer that way uh I'm having my person in the back fact check all of them to make sure it's not I don't get like kicked off YouTube for what you say so they're going to screen it and if it's a good voicemail we'll play it on the show for you so again that number is 2405429877 let's see uh, and that's the thing with all these lakes too. I feel like people, uh, and I think it was, I, mean, I want to get your name right, sir. Brew tank as, uh, as a, as a river rat and you see a Smith and we even mentioned Kerr. There are so many damn points and it's scary as shit. Yeah. How long do you spend in an area? Yeah. For, for, for brew this time of year, my friend, well, two things with that. There's going to be fish on a lot of the points. It's, if you can get them to bite and how long you should stay this time of year, they're very sensitive to being caught. Let's, let's look at it at the grand scheme of the year, guys. They have been pounded, pounded for seven months of seeing every bait under the sun. The points are getting literally beat up every weekend. If you can come, if you can fish on a Wednesday, maybe it's a little bit better this time of year. Once you pull one or two out of the school, I'm gone. I'll come back on them in 30 minutes, but I am not spending 45 minutes on a school of fish. I don't care if it's four pounders that I caught. They're not going to fire off as much as you'd hope, where if you found them in May, you could go back every 10 minutes and catch four. Hmm. Um, just too lure sensitive, line sensitive right now, in my opinion. It's, it's too... It's too pressurized. So I would set an alarm on your phone. If you get on a school, set it for 15 minutes, try four or five baits um switch up your baits if you're getting follows or short strikes but i would not i would not spend a ton of time on them this year this time of year rather. interesting interesting okay it's hard to do it's hard to leave massive schools and it's hard to leave it especially if for example they're blowing up and they're right out of reach and they do it constantly all year long um, but this time especially they they can feel that um i've gotten to the point We've, we've talked about it on the show before. I do think they're starting to understand what the live scope ping is. Yeah. Um, to where I'm finding the schools. And if it's a general, easy target, not a big, like, for example, this, this would be an area I'd probably leave live scope on. It's too broad. Um, but if it was a super, like, obvious point, like, say, this one right here. I would turn live scope off. I would disable my graph and just make a mental reference of, okay, the boat's out here. I'm casting this direction and you're fan casting. It's not too much of an area to cover. Um, Cause I do think they are definitely starting to know what's up. And I would also like to add to this. Um, Cause this, this came up in the discussion last week with, with forward facing sonar and what you need. It is so important to have an external GPS antenna, I think, to where you know where the boat is pointing onto that, onto your mapping software so you can make precision casts. And that doesn't require to have forward facing sonar. It's not that expensive, right. guys. Please right. invest in that. Yeah. I mean, dude, you can go the old school. I mean, I still do it all the time. Pick a tree, pick a like awning on a roof, pick a chair in the yard, like make three references of this, that, and something behind you and just keep referencing that when you make your casts. Um, but in most cases, I mean, I've been leaning on HydroWave a little bit, um, cranking that bad boy up as, as loud as she goes and just running as, as many points as I can on the, on the point deal. Um, but that's just going to be, again, don't, let's go back. Let's use brew tank as just the experiment. That might only be for the first couple of days you're here, bro. Um, and then you might just go fish shallow the rest of the time because with the weather, I'm going to pull it up just to look at it too, but with the weather that's coming, um, 
I mean, dude, Thursday is 59, Friday is 53, Saturday is 51. That's pretty cold That's um, really for it to be for it to be September time frame. Um, and the highs are still up in the 70s, but I, I wouldn't get hooked on that. It's still hot because it's only going to be hot for about six hours out of 24 hours. The other hours are on a cooling trend. It's dark. Like it's causing everything to to move around quite a bit. So don't focus on uh, it's 83 degrees. It's still going to be hot for the next couple of days. Um, you focus on what those nights are. That 51 degree night, that water temperature is going to drop a degree that night. Hmm. So. And I think it's something else you mentioned earlier in the show, and you've mentioned this several times. Understand what type of graph you're running, Garmin, Lawrence, and Hummingbird, and how the temperature sensor is affected. Because Garmin does run a little bit, um, a little bit cooler yep. than the other one. So that's very important information to know when you go out on the water. Yep. Yeah, that app uh, will help. Those are like live. I don't know what thermometers they're using. I, don't, I wouldn't know any of that stuff. But they've got a, they've got one set at 20 feet up at the bridge, which is interesting to see the correlation between three feet and 20. Um, and kind of what's going on. So we should talk turnover if you're cool. I'll just run through Go for turnover it. stuff too, because that's that's probably the other thing that's going to happen here looking at that weather. Um, turnover, guys, this is getting into the super nitty gritty of fishing, um, but this is probably the most important thing of the fall to pay attention to. Turnover is when the stratification of the water from the summer is flipping. And what that means, and, and Thomas, chime in if you have any input on this, but in the springtime, in the winter, all the water is equal water temperature. That's how nature does it. When the water starts to heat up on the top, the top section of the water is going to warm. The bottom section is going to stay cool. In the summer, it creates what's called a thermo thermocline. That is basically a scientific term for oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich water. Every year, the thermocline is different. You can find it by doing 2D, increase your sensitivity, drive around the lake. Um, but basically what it is, is it's where a lot of bait fish are going to end up for the summer. Um, let's just throw it out there. Maybe the plankton or whatever weird, small microscopic stuff they're eating is probably in the thermocline. You can focus in the summer on the thermocline. When these low uh, evening temps are hitting, what is happening is that top layer, think of it like a cake, that top layer that is really, really hot water is going to get cooler eventually than the water that is below the thermocline and the whole lake is going to flip. What that's going to do is that super oxygen rich, nutrient rich water dissipates, spreads throughout all of the water column and that I'm just going to call it dead water that is deep and underneath is going to flip to the top and it's just think of it like a washer machine. It's going to take seven days, 10 days, 12 days for the whole water to kind of calm down. And that makes for super tough fishing, makes for suspended fish. Um, if you think suspended fish are frustrating now, wait till a turnover happens. They just become zombies. They just don't really care. So a couple tips with that, at least on Smith, and, and I would say that this would probably correlate to bugs. I don't know Anna that well, but you want to try to get to moving water if possible. So if we look at how Smith Mountain is set up, it's two rivers that come together. You have the Roanoke River that runs here, and you have the Blackwater River that runs down here. The general rule is if the turnover is super bad, run up the rivers. Even if we haven't had any rain, there's still going to be some water moving from just those rivers dumping into the lake. But that water is going to have a lot less time for turnover. Um, second tip would be the whole lake doesn't turn over the same day. It's not like, holy crap, you show up and the lake's completely turned over and you're screwed. Mm -hmm. It's going to be specific sections. And that's based on water temperature, water clarity. Um, some banks hold sun longer than others. Some hold shade longer than others. So don't get discouraged if you're in an area and it seems really dead. You can move around the lake and find areas that turnover is not happening. The kind of nature thing that I look at is I throw a buzz bait a lot. I can start to notice that the water's thinking about turning over when you throw a buzz bait and the bubbles are super apparent and they don't dissipate. 
So like if you chuck a whopper plopper, a buzz bait, or even a, even a popper or something down the water and you have a full stream of bubbles that follow you back to the boat and you can look back on your five casts and see the stream streaks of bubbles, you're probably in an area where the water's doing something funky and and thinking about turning over or just turned over. Something is different that's allowing that water to, to stay that way. Um, so keep that in mind. Water color will change sometimes. You'll get um, a darker, almost like a root, like a gin, not root beer, um, let's say like, like a cream soda mm. color of brown as opposed to like brown water. It'll be kind of like a, a cream soda color. That's a, that's a sign that the water is flipping over. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, so it, not only is it just the heat difference between the thermocline, it's also the oxygen level. And the reason that you want the moving water is the turbidity, which mixes it, creates that, that um, equal oxygen and equal temperature through the whole thing. And this is why most lakes, the tail race system is terrible during this time of year or just a little bit before because it's sucking out from the deeper part of the lake, which is not oxygenated water. So a lot of times that's an issue. Fun fact, because guys, we did that episode with the Army Corps of Engineers. They actually put holes in the turbines in Kerr so it oxygenates the water into Gaston. So Gaston won't have that problem, which is interesting just to know. And now everyone else knows that crap. <laughs> for the tail race. Yes, for the tail race. But yeah, running up the rivers. That's why they're always one a lot of times. Atafo taking that tunnel hall up uh, uh, Cherokee, Douglas. I think it was. Or Douglas. 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 That's what it was. Thank you. Yeah, I did an open at Douglas, same thing, ran way up. People were running, just so many people were just way up the river where it was tiny water. And that's definitely where it was popping off. So um, hitting back with, with just kind of this being a fishing report for Smith, toss up, maybe turnover only lasts like four days this year. Um, it already seems like fish are, are stacking up ahead by about 30 days in my opinion. Well, I guess we're middle of September, maybe 20 days. Um, but I'm pretty excited deep down with where the water level is and where the fish are that if we do get some, um, if we do get some weird fall rain, I think we're in El Nino. If I remember reading from the spring, I think we flipped, we were El Nino for a couple of years, whatever the wetter one is, um, we're in for supposedly a wetter winter, um. Hmm which I'm cool with being the Minnesota boy. I got my sim suit ready. I got my hats, my gloves. I'm good. I'll go fish in the rain. I don't care. Oh, we got, we got a couple here. Okay. Let's bang this out here. We got uh, Jason Myers after the cool, the, the, the cold front that came through a week or two ago, the lake had a funny color and smelled towards the back of black water. So he's talking about this area. Um, we run way up here which is very, very deep in my opinion, as far as the lake goes. Um, I don't think we would have turnover at that point. Um, look at the water temp way up there. And then while he's looking that up, guys, again, the phone number is 240-542-9877. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna pick one of the people that calls in, they'll win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Um, then we got another one here from, dude, you're killing it in the chat right now. Um, Mr. String eight chilling, I guess I, I can't spell or read, uh, from May to September, I say Austin's mountain. It, uh, it's too much for that little, like, plus this area provides other lakes to go fish that don't get the fishing pressure. Smith mountain does my opinion. I think it's all relative. I've talked to so many people that also fish Kerr and they say that lake is too tiny for all the tournaments. So I, I just, it, you get so accustomed to what you see every day and that becomes your reality. If anything, it's not fishing pressure, it's boat pressure, dude. Smith is Smith Agreed. was a special place uh in July and August this year. Maybe it's just because I was out there so much, but some definite uh definite uh shake your head moments with jet skis cutting in front of you on the bank. I mean, I could have bonked probably eight people in the head with a jig um and knocked them right off the old jet ski, but um that's just part of being on a, a pleasure lake. I don't think this lake sets up in the form of it's too small to have big tournaments. There's so much stuff in here to fish. Um, and there's so many fish and so many big ones that it doesn't fish. It doesn't fish very small to me. Um, but yeah, it's relative. I mean, Phil, Phil pot, I think he was asking about Phil pot. Phil pot's an awesome lake to fish in the summer. Drop good drop shot, lake Ned rig. 
um Demiki swim bait out on suspended fish it's a fun lake to fish um to fish in the summer same thing with bugs though i've heard that too bugs has crazy boat traffic and and kind of staying off of uh staying off a bit for there but i love fishing smith in july and august i think it's again going back to what we kind of labeled lakes i think it's the best lake in virginia oh um, hands down so i don't i love it 12 months out of the year i have nothing bad to say about it um back to jason's point real quick on on black water we did get some weird rain my friend i don't think turnover happened it's still 81 up there at magnums um could just been rain runoff you know that area's got a lot more sediment so like this is called ponderosa right here this is crazy silted in kind of muck um kind of river running here too so when we get a decent rain here you're talking about that muddy water is making it almost all the way down to this section um so could have been some weird rain or, or um water runoff at that point but we're still too far away from it being 80 degrees to be to be turnover is Blackwater more fer fertile than the roanoke river because i hear Blackwater a lot with people i talk to fertile like water nutrient or like bass in there yes to all the above both so I don't think one river section is better than the other. They fire off different times. I think the populations are pretty similar. Hmm. Um, the Roanoke is more, I think the Roanoke has more rock to offer um, and kind of sets up a little bit more with docks and riprap and stuff like that, where the Blackwater still got, <clears throat> you know, you've got red clay flats all the way up into this section here, actually all the way up into this section here. So you're really talking this is where it turns bluffy and, and rocky so i don't i don't know we'll call that five miles just because i have no idea where the roanoke basically when you hit the bridge here you've got all these s curves and stuff that's bluffy and rocky all the way up to uh explorers park way up here hmm. so i don't people ask me that all the time hey i'm in town for a day should i go fish the blackwater or fish the roanoke it's every day is different. I could go to the Roanoke three days in a row and smash their faces in, go the fourth day doing the exact same thing. Conditions are the same and they're not there. And you go to the Blackwater and smash the face in. Um, is, it, is it because Blackwater is smaller, just looking at a map compared to Roanoke. So it's just easier for newbies to just comb through it. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you're talking this section here down, I would consider to be wide water. Um, and then Gills Creek. I mean, dude, you could live in Gills Creek and not even fish anywhere else. Hmm. Um, and there's a lot of retread fish to get released here and just go back and you've got a bunch of cool, unique stuff in, in gills. Blackwater is not really going to turn into a river river until about this section and up. So yeah, it's much more manageable, much smaller, um, much easier to find the features on the actual blackwater stretch of, of the lake for sure. Interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, guys, map study is just so freaking important, uh, even in this day and age, just to be able to break down and understand every every section of the lake. W th this time of year, then, and you mentioned the buzz bait. What what are kind of like your bait selection this time of sure. year? I only have 100 in here. Um, let's go buzz bait first. All right. This is literally the only buzz bait that I have that you cannot even see. So hold on. It is very white. I'll just pop it out. How about that? <laughs> All right, it's a Tackle HD Worldwide Buzzer. Um, James dated. I uh, I've talked to their owner a few times, but um, I shouldn't say all my buzz baits. I probably have like three other ones. But this is a knocker buzz bait. What we mean by that, my friends, is this blade is knocking into the head when it is uh, reeled in, as opposed to one that's just going to be like a whistle um, that's going to be separated from the head. So this thing is insanely loud out of the box and i just prefer something that i know is gonna just piss them off really bad um i don't really dive into the whole like some days they want a squeaky one and some days they want a knocker and some days they want two blades and stuff like that if i'm gonna chuck a buzz bait i'm gonna make something so obnoxiously loud and annoying that the biggest fish that's in the back of the pocket is gonna come crush it hmm. um, kind of the way that i look at it i take the skirts off I'm running like a twin tail grub or I'm running a stinger hook with a horny toad. I'm keeping buzz bait fishing pretty straightforward. Um, I throw a three eighth because when you throw a horny toad on there, it adds enough weight where you can sling that thing and get it accurate. 
a half ounce ones, it's kind of hard to skip those up on our docks, but a three eighth, um, they make black, white, gold blade, all kind of the different blades. You can mess with variation stuff on that, but basically I'm sticking to white and black and uh, just deciding on watercolor and cloud cover or something if I'm going to throw one or the other. Why are you sticking with a skirt versus threading on a fluke, a swim bait, or a frog or something like that? No, I do take the skirt off. Oh, you do? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, I take the skirt off. I'll do a stinger hook with a skirt just to hide the stinger hook, but most cases I'm throwing a swim bait or a twin tail grub. Um, and taking the skirt off. Why a buzz bait versus a whopper plopper? Personal preference. I don't know. Like the big basket, like I've just never crushed on a whopper plopper here to the point where I'm like, <laughs> hell yeah, it's the whopper plopper deal. I've done way better on a buzzer. But then, for example, different lakes, different pace. I go to bugs with a whopper plopper and it's like, that's all they want. As opposed to you go chuck a buzz bait and you'll catch one for every five that you throw the whopper plopper on. It's the same damn thing. Well, yeah. it's not the same thing. The whopper plopper is quieter than this thing, but um, I just never, I have never really caught on to the whopper plopper deal. I mean, dude, I threw the original whopper plopper, which is a top raider, which is a musky bait, which is about 10 inches long. And that's what I grew up throwing for muskies in Minnesota, the top raider. Um, Cause dude, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. Who Larry Dahlberg. Yep. Larry Dahlberg. Yeah. He's a, he's a musky Minnesota boy. Yeah, he so, retired with that bad boy. Good yeah. Boy. Yeah. So I have not. Now, again, it's preference because I know it catches big ones. I mean, I have clients throw it because it's easier to throw it on a spinning rod if they need a spinning rod than, um, than a buzz bait is. But, and the big bass was one on the whopper plopper. I just, I think it's personal preference on that. But I do prefer going with something that is obnoxiously loud. Anybody has a like or has not heard this thing? You can go to like James Watson, James Watson's um, Instagram or something like that, or Tackle HD probably has a video on their site. I have a video posted um, on my YouTube just talking about this buzz bait because it's it's that good in my opinion. Link in the episode description, guys, uh, just to what exactly he's talking about as well. And um, yeah, that's interesting because yeah, it, you get so many baits are kind of like the same thing but different, and then it's just so interesting why one will work in one place and one doesn't. And, and yep. again, you're right, trial and error. You just got to experiment to figure out what what's working. That's why we all have garages full of tackle. Yes, and sometimes not happy wives about it, but oh well. Yes. Um, all right, so that's top water. You're gonna have other top waters you can throw, but I'm just gonna stick a buzz bait in my hand. I think it's the most fun. It draws massive bites. Um, it's fun to skip it up under docks and, and just kind of be a little bit more target precise um, than say a walk and bait or a popper, or a, a prop bait or something like that. So that's, that's me. That's my preference. You can cover a, a shit ton of water with it, put the trolling motor on nine, just put your head down, live scope off, just run. Um, and it's a fun way to really find, find where fish are. Um, I like breaking down like top, medium, bottom. So we're just going to go through that route and I'm not even really going to call all of these out, but this is, right up there with my favorite way to fish, which is cranking. Um, I'm a big fall crank guy, like late fall, but this is going to be, I'm just going to like weirdly show all of them. So this is going to be square bill selection. And this is where I think you can get small differences in baits and get more bites. Oh yeah. Um, so just to run through them really quick, Spro MD this is a flat sided crankbait. If you don't have flat sided crankbaits and you have rounded crankbaits in your box, that's the first thing you need to do. You need to get flat sides in there. It makes a huge difference with the flash of the bait, the buoyancy, how it's going to run in the water. It looks completely different than a rounded bait that's going to run around. So Spro MD, this is just a badass bait in general all year, but this time of year is when this bait's going to shine like crazy. This is just like a clear, I'll back up a little bit, clear shad, um, kind of color, clear water color, uh, messing with that. Bling, jackal bling, crazy loud beads, something different from everybody. It's got one big bead in there too. You guys can hear it every once in a while. Um, super shallow. This thing bounces off of wood like crazy. Um, it's a really, really small bait profile. So what we talk about a lot in September too is the bait size. If you go into the back pocket and you see some bait and your bait's two inches long, then you should be throwing a bait that's two inches long. Um, Keep it, keep it pretty straightforward when it comes to that. Um, they have awesome colors in this and it's just a unique, 
way of getting a square bill, um, something different than they've seen. Another spro bait. When we get these really cold nights that are coming up, so I am going to be gone this weekend. But if I was fishing Sunday morning when it's 51 degrees, I would be throwing some sort of like wake square bill or something like that. So this is a Fat John 50. You guys can hopefully see the bill there. It's this big circuit. This thing's going to dive like two feet max. Hmm. Um, and so again, going with that bait size, this is going to be something that you're going to want to find cover and rip wrap in the back of pockets. Um, in the back of pockets that you can roll this really, really slow over the top of it, burn it too. It's going to stay upright. Um, but some sort of little, little crankbait like this. And then this is, this is little morsel. This is a lucky craft. Uh, I think it's a 0.7 is what they're calling. Yeah. Oh, I love that color. Yep. Nasty, nasty little bait. Um, I don't know what happened to Lucky Craft. I love Lucky Craft, but man, their color selections like four colors per bait. I really wish they would come back with like 50, um, like they used to have, but good, good little crankbait to match that, um, to match that bait size and, and keeping it small. So you can tell just from those on the square bill side, I'm not throwing massive cr square bills. I'm not throwing mid cranks that are big bodied. I am trying to match the little minnows that are going to be swimming around in the backs of the pockets here in the next 20 days. Um, and like I said, you can kind of, each company is going to have baits that are in those size. Those are just the ones that I prefer to have on it. That, that seem to work well at Smith on the mid depth range size. And then I'll just grab two more baits. I'm going to show this one too. I have not thrown this one yet. This stupid screen's making me mad. All right. This is the new, um, Spro speed demon. This is going to be what we'll talk about with moon phase here in a second. But you guys can see, again, really little bait, big circuit bill right there. Mm -hmm. Nice orange on the bottom. You guys can see it. Is um, this bad boy is like a three to five foot. So this is going to be your full moon that we get in September. As we're approaching that full moon, switching from shad colors, going into more of like a dirty root beer, um, a little bit of orange, something to kind of catch them off guard. But this bait is designed to be burned, burned, um, and going into that speed conversation from earlier, this is what you're going to want to do when you have a cloudy day towards the full moon with a cool, cool morning, those fish are going to be wanting to chase stuff down really, really bad. So this looks like a super fun bait. Again, I have not thrown that one yet. I just ordered about six of them. So are you adjusting the gear ratio when you're talking to flat side compared to speed cranking compared to like how is it a one size fits all when it comes to the other parts of your gear? Or no, are you really no, let's let's talk about that for a second, too. I feel like we're going so so back and forth, but hopefully you guys are following along is. As the water continues to cool, you will slow down your gear ratio, but this time of year is when I would be increasing your gear ratio. So for me, like dragging a jig, flipping. Um, top water, they're all eight speeds or higher. I'm going to switch those reels over to cranking reels for the next probably 45 days because I want to be able to catch up line and burn, um, burn baits as fast as I can. Um, and then as the water continues to get cooler, I'll slow down to more of like a six speed um, for like that November into December because I want it slowly kind of kicking around the rocks. But for this time of year, 100% your chatter bait, your trap, um your scrounger head these square bills you want to be able to burn them as fast as possible because you need to um what happens a lot in cranking my brain's going a million miles an hour but what happens a lot in cranking this time of year guys is they still have fast metabolisms they're still warm so when they hit your crankbait they're going to swim towards you for the most part they're going to come up behind your bait hammer it from the back you're going to feel a little bit of it, and then they're going to swim forward with it. You have to have a faster reel to catch up, or you are going to miss a ton of fish. It's um, like a swim bait bite. Yep, that are just going to knock the bait forward. You're not going to be able to catch up. Where in the winter time, for example, the reason I slow down to a six is they're so cold that when they hit it, they almost like they just kind of like stop for a second, and then you can load up and hit them. Where this time of year, they're still very aggressive when they're biting where you are getting knocked in the back and, and you will lose fish if you have a slower speed reel. Um, so that's my tips on the reel stuff. I know it's annoying to like 
reline everything. Like let's say most of your eight speeds have 16 pound line on them. You need to be going down to like 10 to 12, um, maybe 14 for the, for the wood square bill. But if you're just cranking rocks, I'd be doing 10 or 12. Yeah, d definitely 10 or 12. If, if you're, if you're gutsy enough to go to 10, uh, just yeah. always check your damn line guys. No, Get in with that. You have yeah. to. <laughs> uh, tournaments when me and Will are on, on a fall, um, fall crankbait bite or, a, or a early winter crankbait bite, you're retying after every fish, every four spots you're retying just to retie. Even if there isn't a nick in the line, you're doing it to retie it because you know this is the time of year where it could be a seven and a half pounder on the next rock. So you don't want to have any sort of nick in your line um, at all. So you want to answer more questions? You want me to keep going on baits, my friend? Um, guys, I'm going to get to all your questions here in a minute. If you want to get your questions answered, just leave a comment or get or, or you can call in. Either way works. The one more question, and then we can keep going, is hooks. Are okay. you switching out from a round bend to, a, to like a, a, a triple grip? Like, what is your idea on, on hooks with your crankbaits? So spros come with gamagatsus. I leave those ones on. I've thrown gamagatsu forever. That's just what I feel comfortable with. Um, I like... The round bend is good this time of year because again, they're still super aggressive. They're actually eating the bait. Like this is this is the time of year, guys, to have a hema um pair of hemostat pliers. That's the right term, right? Hemostat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I oh god, dang, you just made me forget it. Um yeah, uh, split ring pliers, split ring pliers. Split well, split ring pliers, the hemostat pliers, because or uh, some sort of long needle nose. This is long the time of year where they're going to crush these crankbaits to where you're going to have, unfortunately, oh, okay. I see where you want that. Yeah. yeah, where you need to be able to kind of do surgery, surgery on them where in the, so that's why the round bends are cool with me. The only hook I would change out is I go to uh, Aaron Martin's G finesse nano hook. Um, some guys hate them. Will's not a huge fan of them because he thinks they're too thin. Um, but me personally, this is totally preference. Everyone is different. I crank on glass rods. I crank 10 pound line and I leave my drag pretty loose um, because if I can get them to swipe at a bait, I can feel it enough in a glass rod and sweep them where if I was on a round bend hook, I don't feel like I'd get enough penetration where with a thin nano, I've caught plenty of big ones, single back hook outside of the mouth, just laser cuts right through their gill, like right through their mouths, the hard parts. Um, and that's the only other hook that I change out is I'll change some baits to that nano hook. I think this is so important that we're having this conversation now because people will buy a bait and they'll put it on their flipping stick or, or, or spinner bait rod and be like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. You have to match the hook, the line, the rod. And so you guys know that I've been winning tournaments here on the Potomac for, for smallmouth. And I have five and four pound leader. But I have to match that up to like a medium light rod for those small hooks, or yeah. I'm just going to tear the hook out. This is, I, I preach it. Like, I understand 100% what you're saying. If you're going to go with those softer hooks, you can't have a thick stout rod. It's just yeah. going to be a disaster. And dude, we'll, we'll talk about it. I know we're going to talk about my bait shop on my website, but yeah. the Dobbin 705 CB glass is just my favorite rod that they make. It's just a nasty, it's got a enough backbone. You can crank mid if you needed to mid depth cranks, square bills, warts, rock crawlers. Like it is just the most sensitive cranking rod I have used in my entire life. It pins big ones. It's soft enough in the tip that like once they're pinned, I rarely lose fish. Um, I rarely, rarely lose fish on that rod. And if if you match it right again, which you're talking about ten pound line and and you're cranking at the right speed and you feel that pressure and you're able to sweep them with the drag right, it's just a deadly combo for for catching fish that are transitioning so good stuff great great stuff um, but yeah so, sorry for for uh getting you off topic there you're good. No, that's important i know everybody doesn't want to own 100 rods but this is the small stuff that will make you go from having heartbreak of throwing a crankbait on a spinnerbait broomstick and losing a seven pounder um as opposed to getting it in the boat so these, these are things that I preach to guide clients all the time on, on the correct rods and it increases your fishability and, and catchability and all that. So, so that's the, the kind of mid ish depth. I'm going to have two more baits that I'm going to talk real quick on the mid depth and then we'll just get into some dragging stuff. Super overlooked bait beyond basic. A five year old could throw this and catch bass. Okay. This is a pulse head, scrounger head, whatever you want to call it. 
It's basically a thin piece of plastic that's on a jig head. Fluke bait. You can throw a twin tail grub. Um, you could throw one that's that I've kind of played with a little bit this year is that um, heat crack gill, like some sort of mm. piece of plastic that's enough looseness where you're going to get a kick. The reason we go with the fluke a lot is the bait fish are going to be really tight wobbly this time of year. This is going to have a super tight wobble to it. And you're going to get that perfect flash of, of what a minnow looks like. Kind of, you guys can kind of see it on the screen there. Like mm -hmm. you'll kind of get that random flash, um, with the pulse head. And this is literally a cast it out and reel it in. You don't even have to pause it that much. Um, so easy a kid could do it. So this goes on my deck. Um, this is a good search bait cover bait. You can toss this in two inches of water or you can toss this on suspended fish over 30 feet. Same concept and it's weight work size. Out. What weight size then? Three I eight. have quarter ounce and three eighth is, is what I'm throwing for, for majority of them. So, um, and then same thing, like this is going to go on a seven, three, four power rod, 12 pound line, maybe up to 15 if I'm in some dirtier water. Um, and I just don't want to worry about it. Um, hmm. but that is a, if you're new to fishing and struggling for the fall. This will catch you fish. This can catch you a big one. Um, it's, it's a solid all around bait. Next one, everyone should also have these, even if you're new, jackhammer, duh. Um, it's just, these just catch fish. They're just awesome. There's not really much you need to say about them. A um, couple differences that I like to do is I throw a lake fork, um, magic shad on the back. I like that extra kick or a guy, what is it? A, um, the Yamamoto bait. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it, Zico? Yeah, yeah, Zico shad. Whatever, whatever the broken tail shad is, I'm a big, um, a big believer in that extra kick. Um, half ounce shatter bait. It's hard to beat. Again, you can chuck this thing along the riprap. You can chuck this at suspended fish and still get them to bite. You can skip these under jigs really or under docks really well. Um, and it's just, it's a great way to get that reactive bite. I would compare a chatter bait to what a buzz bait does on the surface. It's gonna be the loudest thing that runs through the back of the pocket. It's annoying. You can hear it if the conditions are right, you can hear a chatter bait coming in, like it's obnoxious. Um, and I think that's what draws big strikes on chatter baits is it's the same concept as the buzz bait. You're back there, there's a big one, you're annoying. I'm just gonna eat you. Hmm. So keep going. Keep going. Keep them going, my friends. All right. These are the last baits. Um, and then we can get to answering questions. Hopefully people are still around. So next thing, and we're gonna I'm gonna transition a little bit into moon phase. So these next three months of moon phase is also probably right there behind those top three that I mentioned earlier. Crawdads are gonna start moving around like crazy. They know that it's cooling. Crawdads have to burrow um, into the winter. So they're going to start molting. They're going to start running to the bird running. <laughs> they're going to start swimming to the bank. Um, it's very moon phase and water temperature based. Smith Mountain is loaded with riprap, loaded with natural rock, loaded with sheet rock. And what you're going to see is as we get closer to full moons every month coming up, you're going to transition from shad baits to crawdad style of either crankbaits or some sort of dragging bait, shaky head jig, Texas rig, something along those lines. Um, this is probably the first month where it's gonna just kind of start. October, November's full moons are gonna be the best for the for the year as far as it comes to jig fishing. So hmm. with that, I'm just gonna grab literally just randomly grab a couple. So I throw two jigs. I throw any jig that Missile makes, or I throw a Dobbins jig. This is a Dobbins football head. Um, it's got an EWG hook. Some guys don't like them. They do have um, just regular hooks. I'm going to go for two different profiles. I want a big old jig. You guys can see I got big old pocket craw on there. And then I'm going to go for something that's going to be a little bit more condensed. Um, this might not be the best example. Let me look here. 
This doesn't have a trailer on it, but I'll just show you guys. This is just a little flip jig from Missile. So flip jig, big old football jig. You guys should see the size comparison there. If this is going to be a full meal for a big old girl, this is going to be your all around jig that's going to be able to put numbers in the boat as well as um, as well as size. Missile's good for having a bunch of different hooks on their jigs. So you can get like an actual big flipping hook. You can get a little thin wire hook on it. Um, it's kind of preference. That flipping hook is the best like get through cover jig. Um, not flipping hook. The flipping jig is the best like get through cover. You can throw it in wood. You can throw it in rock. You can throw it on clay stumps. It doesn't matter. The thing almost never gets stuck. The only other thing on jig fishing that I would say is with that molting is going to come color change. So if you're a jig nerd and want to get into it, I'm not the best jig fisherman. This is just what I have learned and what I go to, to the lake with is you're going to want to start playing with colors. So this is just a skirt that I randomly tied together. I'm going to do things this time of year, like go to the ramp and flip some rocks or go to the boat ramp and just see if there's crawdads swimming around. We're lucky at this lake, Dwayne up at Captain's, um, he will put a trap out. I think in the next couple months and show you guys what the crawdads look like as far as colors go. Um, so matching that it's hard to beat just green pumpkin Brown, but playing with a little bit of color can make a big difference on the jig bite this time of year, as far as where they are molting and, and getting more bites. Is that where kind of like jig fishing and swim baits are kind of the same where the devil's in the details when it comes to how realistic it looks, the color patterns and everything. Cause I hear that with guys that when they do trout swim baits, it's like, if that thing, that thing has to look like the stock trout or the kokanee or whatever to get a conversion to a bite. I think so this time of year more than any. Um, and I think that has to do with water clarity and it has to do with that molting process. Um, a lot of guys will probably be surprised this time of year. There's actually a lot of blue in the crawdads. So you'll get like a, you'll have like a weird spectrum. You'll, you'll, I'll have some days where I go down there and there it's obvious, like brown, red, like it's obvious or like a little bit of orange on a pincher. So I'll do like a strand of orange or I'll dye one pincher orange, um, with garlic. But then you go down two days later and you flip one and it's like translucent -y blue, um, hmm. and really dark green. So I don't know if that's like male, female crawdads or if there's some sort of difference there on them. Um, I will say on the crawdads here, size wise, don't be afraid to throw a massive jig. There are huge crawdads in here. I'm talking like palm of your hand size. Damn. Um, and there's definitely bass that are eating, eating those. I've had plenty of spit up live wells with, with pinchers that were two inches long, like baby lobster stuff. Um, I don't know how they don't get eaten right away. Um, but there's some, there's some very, very large crawdads in here. So tapping on that for a split second too with moon phase, as we get into October, November, and I'm sure you and me will do a, a winter report also, but as you get close to the full moon, three days before full moon, three days after that's your prime time, I would still be chucking a jig around before that, but that's going to be your prime time of Crawdads are running around. Again, going back to if we're warm and two days before the full moon, we get a crack of a cold snap. I, it would be hard for me to not go out there and start throwing a jig, um, hmm. even right away in the morning. Even if top water was going on, it'd be hard for me to not go chuck a jig um, because those big fish do know that and those big fish do move up on that stuff um, off of the shad. So that's one of the bottom baits the other bottom one is again a no-brainer i didn't even bring the hook in that's a shaky head you can think it's funny or loser ish to throw a shaky head on a spinning rod i've caught more big ones on drop shot and shaky head than probably any bait combined as well it's easy to guide anybody can do it i keep the shaky head stuff super easy throwing it around the full moon literally just three baits Ultra vibe, zoom speed, craw. It's been around for 150 million years. It's just a really, really good bait. Missile baits makes a twin turbo. So if you need something that's kicking more, let's say they're just really aggressive that day, um, the twin turbo is gonna have more of like a Mr. Twister tail as the speed craw is gonna kind of be more like this speed. This, this twin hmm. tail rubs like crazy fast. Um, and then I have been throwing this a lot this year is this missile baits chunky D. 
thicker profile, good kind of craw action. It's got the little extra tentacles out of the side. It, it just kind of, again, like we're talking like swim baits, it just kind of matches a little bit better. Um, throw it on a bigger, bigger shaky head. You can get away with throwing these on like a bait caster and a shaky head. Um, and having a little bit of orange, you guys can see that color in there. Excuse me. Um, is a great, great way to kind of play with it. If you got two guys in the boat and it's full moon time, this is the time of year to throw two jigs. Have one guy throwing a big jig that's green pumpkin and green pumpkin and blueish and a strand of orange and have another guy that's throwing a straight brown one with the brown, you know, with the brown one that's a, a smaller jig. So that is, um, that's very high level on my baits, my friend, but that hopefully should help people from top to bottom with, with what's going to happen here in the next probably two months. And I know guys, we got a bunch of people in the chat. So again, you know, drop your question right now. Uh, and then I'll have, we'll, we'll draw for the gift card giveaway here in a minute. So good question. We'll get a gift card. Uh, my question with that would be with swim baits, uh, this time of year, it, does the glide bait play at all? Does a, a, a swim wake bait thing play at all? Like is any of that play or are you putting that in the back shelf till later in the year? The only, and I didn't even grab my glide baits even after I told you I was going to go grab them. So, <laughs> Here's what I'll say on the glide bait game, my friends. And um, you and me should just do a show for big baits, dude. We should do a big bait show. Yeah, that'd be fun. Is matching the hatch is really important this time of year, more than any time of the year. So I've noticed a lot of followers on the glides right now. I'm not getting as many commits as I feel like I would have in the spring with like the gizzard shads running up. I'm not seeing a ton of gizzard shad. I'm seeing minnows that are three inches long or smaller. Um, good search bait still. Definitely good search bait of if you're going into a tournament or let's say Brews down here and wants to catch the bass of his life, go throw a glide bait for three days, figure out what area of the lake has six, seven, eight pounders around it and go back and toss your match the hatch baits. Um, paddle tails and stuff, I don't really throw them. Um, I don't really throw them this time of year. I feel like they're, they stand out too much. For example, if you're running a back pocket here in the next three weeks and you're running a buzz bait and you're getting four pounders to bite, I don't think throwing a mag draft down the middle of the gut when the bait's three inches long is going to draw, at least for me, I could be completely wrong and this is why I lose, is um, that I don't have confidence in as far as what I have experienced. Um, but again, I haven't gone and um, necessarily done that or thrown that stuff. So. Um, yeah, that's my take on the big baits for for this time of year. It's going to kick in by by December when they're really really putting their feed bag on. I think that's when you're going to start seeing those fish going from just kind of looking at it to okay, we got to make a decision. That for me is like 55 degree water, not 70. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it yeah, it, every time of year is so important. This is why, you know, it's certain techniques, guys, devil in the details, and don't just live and die with some things because I know there's anglers out there. I know them, you know them, mm -hmm. where, yeah, it's just one thing that they'll throw and that's it, live or die by it. Yeah. Um, now we do have, now we got a ton of questions. So now we got this built up. So let's, let me see how the hell do I want to start with this? Uh, um, let's go with fishing coach. This is fishing coach number one. Um, let's see. More importantly, what types of areas would you not waste your time on? I think that's with this one here. Uh, not searching for numbers, but just for five pounders, what areas and techniques are going to give you the best opportunity in the next coming weeks to catch a five plus pounder? Um, yeah. and so what do you think about that? Can we see the map back up? Is that possible? Yes. Hold on. There Look at us. We're so cool with our computers. Yeah. Technology. All right. Um, my friend, areas to ignore this time of year, in my opinion, would be your big clay flat stuff. Um, I don't think the bluebacks are coming up to that stuff just yet. So, uh, avionics with that stupid mouse touch. Um, on Smith, these types of areas here are all red clay, maybe some stumps mixed in here and there. Red clay, um, red clay. That's going to be in my opinion, most of the fish are going to skip past right past this stuff. So if you've got, say, rocky structure here, three cool nights, they're not going to run and stop here. They're going to run until they get back to rocky structure back in here. Again, going back to the crawdad thing and what we're talking about with the moon phase, they're targeting the schooling minnows, which are going to run to the back, the thread fins. That's the majority of what our forage is. And they're going to focus on crawdads. 
So that would be the area of stuff that I would stay away from um, and not get locked into. There's still going to be fish out there on them, but the bigger fish, I think, are going to start keying in on secondaries and back flats, not main lake clay flats. So that would be the first thing that, that I would do. Um, and then as far as this is where this transition speed is going to come into play. If you told me you were coming this week, I would say secondaries. Looking at the weather, if you're telling me you're coming next weekend, if we get another run of three or four nights in the 50s, I would be looking all the way in the backs of pockets for five pounders. Um, fall and spring are the same transition. And if you guys have watched podcasts with me and Thomas before on my spring deal, the biggest bass of the year are the first ones to move up in the spring. It's the same thing in the fall. The biggest bass are going to, the big, big fish are going to move into the backs of the pockets before everybody realizes it and be on their way out when these three to four pounders roll in in October and November. So getting, I don't want you to get too far ahead, but that's what, where I would look. Like I'm going back to Minnesota next week, so I have a whole week where I'm not going to fish. When I come back from Minnesota, my gut is going to tell me, I'm going to go look for bait in the backs of pockets in zero to five feet of water to look for isolated five pounders. Guys, the wisdom is just flowing through. I mean, he's wiser and easier. Should I get my lightsaber out? Yeah, you really should. That'd be for the different, that'd be for the after hour show. Um, let's see good here. Okay. Uh, Michael guy, I can't, I can't speak worse. So I'm going to say Mitch Kershenny. I don't know. Kill, kill me in the comment section. When is the best time in the year to book a trip with Billy for the big ones? If you are comfortable throwing a bait cast, my friend, you need to book me in March. Um, late March into April is when we're going to see the biggest influx of, of big females chucking big baits. Um, be mentally prepared that you are coming here and we are fishing for two bites a day, max. Um, when you're not going to come down here in March and throw... <clears throat> throw a big bait, big glide, Alabama rig, and catch 10 bass in a day. Uh, I would consider five to six bass in a, in a winter or early spring day to be, to be very good out here, at least when we're targeting that caliber. We got him again. I was getting the shit kicked out of me. Uh, decided to take a trip with Billy, and he got me on a fish. 10 out of 10 recommend. Oh, well, good. Now I feel bad because I probably should remember you, Mitch. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, my friend. Uh, let's see. We got guys, man, they're rolling in now. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm string. I do. I'm just going to say chilling because I apparently oh, can't speak. Uh, any advice for smallmouth? Yep. Um, this year has been awesome. The smallmouth never disappeared like they did the last three years. Um, I have been catching smallmouth almost at the same numbers that I've been catching largemouth for the entire year, um, which has been super, super fun. So smallmouth on Smith Mountain is your best numbers size population is April. When they are up about to spawn, pre-spawn, they're easy to target, they're super aggressive, they're easy to spot because the water's clear, they're, they're coming up, they turn really dark brown that time of month or that time of year in that month. Um, but generally speaking, Smith Mountain sets up where here's the confluence of our two rivers, this section down here would be referred to as the lower end. The lower end of the lake is going to house probably 60 to 70% of the smallmouth population. So if you are wanting to come here and book a trip to do smallmouth, you want April or you want June or you want probably November. Um, and in most of those trips, we're not running up the rivers. We're not doing anything like that. We're focusing on natural rock on the lower end, transition spots. The smallmouth are going to be a little bit deeper on this lake compared to say where I'm from in Minnesota, where you're fishing like humps and flats, um, winter time fishing for smallmouth here is going to be like up to 30 to 40 feet sometimes. Um, but that is, if anybody calls me and says, Hey, I just want to try to go catch some smallmouth. When's the time of year and what, what area should I focus on? That's, that's pretty textbook Highland reservoir. And that kind of feeds into this next question, uh, which is from, from Chuck, uh, is there any time of year that you specifically target small yeah. mouth? Boom. Uh, yeah. there you go. I would say Chuck, um, like I had a super fun day with, with one of my buddies, Matt, I think we had 31 smallies in a four hour trip. We only went into two pockets 
in four hours and they were all like three plus. Um, that's a special day here. If you're wanting numbers and size, you're, you're needing to book in. I would say I'll, I'll give you two options. Pre-spawners, you're going to want to book in April, maybe late March into early April. Um, or the way that I really like to catch them is post-spawn top water on the lower end, which is late, like last week of May into the first two weeks of June. Um, most of the lower end is going to be post-spawn smallies, big walking baits, flukes, um, and they're super aggressive that time of year. So that'd be the two times that I would try to get down here. Shane Flynn, Shane Flynn Outdoors. You talked about crayfish type jig fishing. Do you fish a swim jig with a swim bait trailer? I do not throw one for craw eaters, Shane. I throw a swim jig for bluegill eaters. So you technically could with where the bluegills are this time of year and, and with them staying shallow, you could throw um, you could throw a swim jig right now, just a bluegill colored one along the riprap and, and back on some of the dock posts. That's really for Smith. That's all I'm going to throw it. Um, we don't have grass here, so there's not really anything that you're ripping it through or, or causing it to react that. So a lot of times this time of year, I'll just swim a football jig back. Like once I'm past the rock, you kind of snap jig it up and then swim it back to the boat. Um, but we do have a good swim jig bite when the shad spawns on, man. It's uh, It definitely sets up similar to like Lake Norman um, with floaters and stuff where you can throw a white swim jig here in the, in the shad spawn. That's freaking awesome. All right, guys. Yeah, we are going to town. You're actually getting through these today. Sweet. Uh, Greg Howard, is the football jig your go-to jig to throw on Smith Mountain? Um, yes. I would I would say probably 70% of the time it's just a football jig in some form or another um, to toss around because we do have a lot of rock here. Again, going back to water fluctuation too, if the, we're at full pond, there is a ton of rock to throw at tons of riprap tons of rock transition um we have what's called i just refer to it as sheet rock here it's almost like a natural long skinny rock that will run under the riprap and out um, once you graph those and mark those that's getting really dialed in on the rock and specific targets but you'll see rock sheets that run out to 14 to 18 feet of water um, and you can work a jig through those snap jig, work a crankbait. Those are, uh, those are great rock transition spots. Good stuff. Good stuff. And we got two more actually in the queue right now. Sweet. This is awesome. We're actually going to finish up on time. We don't have to do a catch up show. Uh, Jason Myers looking forward to fall and spring trip. If you haven't fished with Billy yet, I highly recommend it. Thanks Jason. Thanks man. And then, okay. I don't know how I missed this one from earlier. Uh, Matthew, uh, off subject, has, has anyone ever fished Somerville Lake in West Virginia? Just curious if it's decent. I have not. <clears throat> I went there uh, to help film for uh, Bass University. I did some camera work for them. Um, and we went to Somersville for what was the episode even for? Something with Spro. I don't remember exactly, but rough super super clear and not very big fish um it looks like there there's a decent spring bite there um but i know we we did some filming that day and we decided at the end of the day we were like ah, i don't know if that lakes the deal and at dinner i pulled up like uh tournament weights and it was like seven pounds nine pounds kind of like to win and i was like yeah we gotta we gotta find a different lake guys like this is not gonna this is not gonna pan out to be a bang and show if we're um if we're only catching you know 10 inches all day how did you how'd that happen uh if you know dude let's fish on mm -hmm. uh so that's shannon wheeler um really good buddies with him and uh he does some camera work for them and some social media stuff i think and they just needed an extra cameraman so i just hopped in the truck and went overnight got the hotel stay and got to hang with the boys on that show it's a cool experience but yeah that lakes that the West Virginia lakes are definitely, um, definitely interesting. Yeah. J JR knows. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Somerville is very tough. I'm a local at the lake. He also says if you're fishing West, West Virginia, do Stonewall. I know they had a high school tournament there in the springtime. Um, yeah. and I'll be trying to get those boys on as well. Uh, brew tank. I think you're going to have the last one of the night so we can let this boy get some sleep. Uh, biggest striper Billy's caught on bass gear, Smith mountain lake. 
Yep. It was over 20 pounds in a tournament the first January I was here. Skipped the 2.8 Kaizek under a dock on seven pound line. That's freaking awesome. Yep. Yeah, I, thought it, I thought it was the kicker fish too. I needed it uh, really bad and saw the flash and then gave it about five seconds and realized what was about to happen. Wow. Super shallow too. I'm talking like five feet and just one striper under there and smoked it. Um, yeah. That's... Yeah. And that's another thing about, you got to make sure, you, depending when you're fishing schooling stuff, get your drag set, guys. So you don't yes. break off a very important bait because you had it tied down and then a 20 pound, 30 pound striper just, just blows up your reel. Yep. Uh, another thing I will say on checking drag too, I have to do this with guiding all the time. I think a lot of people don't realize this. When you put lures back on your reels and you pull that drag to like kind of get the bow out of the rod, your hand knocks into that drag system a lot or when you're going down the lake and like i use a ranger seatbelt strap or whatever something is hitting those drag systems and causing them to crank like one or two clicks or maybe guide clients do it by accident um but i've made it a habit in tournament time to check my drag every stop just for some reason i want to make sure it's tight enough or um if it loosened or or vice versa if it tightened up i need to i need to loosen it a little bit so um, do you want me to bring up bait shop stuff super quick and then we can wrap it up? Absolutely. Go cool. for it. So, um, this is super cool. I think on my end, because this is what the majority of questions that I get with guiding. And obviously I love doing the podcast with you and stuff like that. That's not going to stop is number one question I get from guide trips is if I could go buy X amount of baits. What would you get? Tell me to get, or for example, throughout the couple of years of guiding, I've made an Excel spreadsheet and I've sent to clients of like, okay, you're new to fishing. Here's 20 baits to get. Here's a line to get. Here's the rods to get all that sort of stuff. So I, in my low sleep and ADHD entrepreneurism style on my website, I created a web page called the bait shop. I am going to split out every transitional time of fishing that I think is important and list out specific baits, um, backlinked to, for you guys to be able to purchase, um, to make it easy. So I don't have to send the spreadsheet or, you know, kind of answer a hundred different questions. This is a high level, well, I, I wouldn't even say the high level. It's definitely dug in a little bit with what baits people need, some unique baits to try, um, some bigger baits like the glide stuff, rods specific like we were talking about earlier what rods go with what and what line um reels and all that sort of stuff so i, I appreciate you dropping that in the link but anybody that has, has uh, questions on that i filled out all it's very time consuming um but all the early fall baits that i would toss um are links up there for you guys to know exactly what i'm throwing if anybody has questions on colors or anything like that they can hit me up through through social or email but i'm hoping that's a situation where people can watch this or go to the fishing report and, and jump over to that section in the website and just say, okay, I'm low on this type of bait. Here's the ones that, that, uh, that Billy would throw. And they're not specific just to Smith majority are, but they're going to work at most places. But, um, hopefully that, hopefully that helps some people out. Yeah, guys. And again, link in the episode description to his shop and that'll be on, you know, YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple podcasts everywhere. Uh, and then before we get into our winners, the other thing is to, uh, for, if you guys, are new to the podcast and just listening, you know, we did start a Patreon. We have some goals that are really kind of awesome. Our overarching goal is once we hit 3000 Patreon members, we can start a nonprofit and we can specifically start stocking all of our local waterways. This includes helping with smallmouth stocking of the Shenandoah river, the new river, all of our different river systems, the James river, but then also Smith mountain Lake as well. We also have another tier, which if we can hit that, we'll be giving away over a thousand dollars a month in prizes and a guided trip every single month, including a trip with Billy Coles, just to be able to give back to all the guides that make these fisheries important. So if you actually care about our fisheries and you've been complaining about them, I'll, I'll take the risk and create the nonprofit, but I just need your help. And so just, if you want to just look at the five-year plan for fishing the DMV, you can go on to the Patreon and just read it. It's free just to do that. Um, and with, with that needless, shameful plug out of the way, the winners are, we're going to go, uh, uh, Kirshen, you're going to win a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. And then I, whatever the hell your name is, I'm sorry. I'm straight. Yeah. Meat killing. You're going to win as well. So just please message me, email me. I don't care how you get a hold of me and uh, I'll get you guys that gift card as well. Uh, good stuff there. I mean, yeah. Closing thoughts. It's going to be, 
I think a fun fall at Smith. I think it's going to turn over. At least I hope it's going to turn over quicker than normal. Smallmouth aren't super deep. I think they're going to come up and, and chew pretty quick. And um, I'm hoping when I get back from Minnesota that it's it's cold here. I hope it's cold and I hope we get a random hurricane that dumps six to 12 inches of rain in two days. Um, and if it does and you want to book a trip, hit the gas. Like hit the gas hard if you uh, can remember that. So, but I have to leave a day open for Thomas to come during that time. Yes, eventually, eventually we're gonna make that work out, guys. Again, uh, like subscribe to the channel. Please give Billy a follow. Go book a trip with him. Go throw some money at him. He needs it desperately. He's got a crazy house with a kid and puppies and everything. He needs your help. And, and uh, food and diapers. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. Thanks, bud. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.